20 miles northeast of the iconic Giza Pyramid Complex stands the world's oldest surviving obelisk, dating to roughly 1900 BC. Originating from the Greek obeliskos, meaning pointed pillar, an obelisk is a tall four-sided narrow tapering monument which ends in a pyramidion at the top. In Egypt, hieroglyphs were carved into all four sides and they often recorded battles, special events, or the history of the region. The obelisks of Egypt were erected maybe centuries after standing stones like the ones in Karnak in Brittany. But they're monoliths too, one solid piece of stone. The obelisks of Egypt too are made of red granite. And red granite is a very special kind of granite. It's infused with tiny quartz crystals. And this gives the obelisk a certain type of energy. And the ancient peoples were aware of this energy that was coming out of the obelisk. They actually thought the obelisk was alive. And this is very reminiscent of the ancient standing stones that are even older. Is it more than mere coincidence that the Egyptians erected monolithic stones that were rich in quartz crystal? Just like ancient cultures in other parts of the world did thousands of years earlier. Had they discovered the secret of the ancient standing stones and their power to harness the energy of the Earth? Ancient astronaut theorists say yes and point out that the Egyptians believed the obelisks provided a profound connection to the gods. The obelisk itself, like a cathedral, lifts up into the heavens. It is pointing to the heavens. It is a connection to the gods. And at the top of an obelisk in ancient Egypt, there was a special stone, the capstone, the pyramidium. It was the shape of a pyramid. It was made of specially fine granite, polished uh, with some uh, hieroglyphics, but the main detail was it was brightly gilded in pure gold so that the sun would bounce off that and beams would glow from miles around. It must have been dazzling. This was the point of contact between humans and the gods. This was how we communicated with the gods through that stone. You'll see the top of the obelisk reaching into the sky. They think of it as a sort of a, an axis mundi. It's a, it's a way of connecting Earth with the heavens. Egypt was given, according to ancient texts, the powers of heaven. Egypt became a mirror of the heavens. And that the powers that are found in the heavens are found on Earth, in Egypt, as above, so below. Mainstream scholars interpret this connection to the heavens as purely symbolic. But ancient astronaut theorists suggest that the obelisks were recreating the technology of another world and that these giant stone pillars were part of a vast wireless energy grid, one that also incorporated the power of the pyramids. It's a fascinating idea that like we would charge a phone on a charging pad just by placing it there. These extraterrestrials can recharge their own craft off of these standing stones and obelisks. You have to wonder whether pyramids had exactly the same purpose. Could there be even more highly advanced technology way beyond any technology that we even know? A lot of people don't realize this, but Tesla's original design for the Wardenclyffe Tower was actually to be the same height as is the pyramid from the base to the tip of where that conductor piece used to be on top of the pyramid. And at the time he was building it, in the 1908-ish time frame, JP Morgan had an expedition in the pyramids and were sending information to Tesla while he was working on the Wardenclyffe Tower. Nobody knows why and what the results of that was and to what end, but it seems suspect that Tesla wanted to do something with wireless transmission of power from a system that's the same height as the pyramids. Do they believe that that's what the pyramids were for? The walls of the Great Pyramid, like the obelisks, contain a high concentration of quartz crystal. Could it be that this massive monument, in conjunction with other ancient structures, made up a global wireless energy network.
by placing some of these obelisks and standing stones around the Earth in combination with pyramids, if you have the correct technology, you can use that energy. And it seems that this could have been a worldwide system of power and that spacecraft, submarines, other electric devices could draw their power from the atmosphere because it was being put out by these pyramids and by these obelisks. Tuscany, Italy, 2004. After years of studying the nature of electromagnetic and gravitational fields, celebrated futurist and Nobel Prize nominee Dr. Irvin Laszlo announces that he has found evidence of the A, or Akashic field. Dr. Laszlo took work from the discovery of the quantum zero-point energy, which is a radiation field that exists all around us that we can't perceive, but we can detect it indirectly. It's very solid theoretically. It was first discovered by Einstein. So we know that the zero-point energy exists, and it carries a lot of information about the universe in it. Laszlo proposed that this didn't carry just a physical information about the physics of the universe, but also it contained intellectual information. According to theoretical physicists, zero-point energy is an all-pervasive sea of quantum energy waves that is invisible but exists throughout the universe. The fabric of space itself is made of energy and information. And the way this information propagates through the universe is through waves. We call that quantum waves. And so the Akashic field is made of quantum waves that are common to all intelligent life. This means that all human brains, extraterrestrial brains, any sort of otherworldly beings also are tapping into similar quantum waves. This idea of an intelligent informational field that we can access with our consciousness is not pseudoscience, it's not superstition. It is a basic fact that our scientists are finding out is really true. Nearly two decades prior to Laszlo's discovery, Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman published his groundbreaking work in quantum physics, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter. In it, he explored the idea that electrons in our brains can be activated and informed by quantum waves, affecting our thoughts and subconscious. So Richard Feynman talked about the quantum entanglement theory and the idea that you could have subatomic particles at any distance whatsoever and they could affect each other where information can be sent uh, at great speeds, uh, instantaneously actually. The human brain is full of electrical activity that creates radiation that a very sensitive radio receiver could pick up and other minds other places would also be able to send such waves. Feynman found from the idea of a quantum field of information, an electron moving in our brains could be receiving radio signals from the past, but to compensate, it must also receive waves from the future. Now, this means that every electron in our brains is actually a receiver information could traverse to any part of the universe instantaneously, this could mean that intelligent civilizations could send complex information to us by quantum wave propagation or other means. They could very much be nudging society along through people having apparent visions, which could be nothing more complex than a radio broadcast, some sort of thought transference through the Akashic Record. Baalbek, Lebanon. Here, in the fertile Bekaa Valley, stands what many consider to be the greatest ruin of Roman antiquity, the colossal temple of Jupiter. But the imposing remains that tower over the site today 
are only the latest in a long line of structures erected on this spot. Archaeologists say the area has been continually inhabited for at least 10,000 years. And no one knows who built the first place of worship here. But according to legend, both Egyptian and Assyrian conquerors erected sanctuaries on the site, followed by the Canaanites and Phoenicians, who built a great temple here to their god Baal around 2500 BC. Baalbek is one of those places where you have different people over millennia building their shrines, their temples to their particular, you know, gods or goddesses. You've got this temple that's built by the Phoenicians for one of their deities, Baal. Then Alexander the Great conquers this area and surprise, surprise, builds a temple to the Greek gods. In the first century BC, roughly 300 years after Alexander the Great, the Romans conquer Lebanon and decide to erect a temple here to their chief god, Jupiter. The main Roman temple once boasted 54 columns, each a staggering 65 feet in height. But while visitors to the ruins may first notice the towering Roman columns, the most impressive feature at Baalbek is its massive foundation. To this day, Baalbek, Lebanon has remained one of the most enduring mysteries on planet Earth because the masonry that we find there is unparalleled compared to the rest of the world. In fact, there are three stone blocks called the trilithons, each weighing approximately 800 metric tons, which is 1.6 million pounds. Each of these blocks is approximately 62 feet in length by about 14 feet in depth and 12 feet in breadth and they're not even on the ground. So whoever placed them there in ancient times would have had to have raised them up to a height of about 20 feet. Each of the stones were quarried two miles away and put perfectly into place with such precision that you can't even put a credit card or a needle in between those massive blocks. How ancient people carved and moved such massive stones is a question that baffles archaeologists to this day. And equally as mysterious is who placed them there. The giant blocks in the foundation are clearly of a different building style than the temples that sit above. And in my opinion, that platform is not just ancient, it is prehistoric. But if the platform at Baalbek was constructed thousands of years before the Romans arrived in the Bekaa Valley. Why did they choose this as the site to build their most magnificent temple? One pioneering Russian scholar has proposed that humans may have been drawn to this location because it was the site of one of Earth's earliest extraterrestrial events. Leningrad, USSR. 1961, scientist and mathematician Dr. Matest Agrest sends shockwaves through the world of academia with an article in which he poses a new theory called paleocontact, a precursor to what is known today as the ancient astronaut theory, suggesting that certain biblical texts could be interpreted as evidence of alien visitation. And according to Agrest, one place where such visitations occurred was Baalbek. Dr. Matest Agrest went into the ancient record, the Book of Enoch and other Hebrew texts, and noticed that there were beings coming from the sky or the stars that came to Earth. And he came up with a theory that they were extraterrestrial beings who came to Earth to assist humanity in developing advanced technology to build stone constructions such as what we see at Baalbek in Lebanon. Agrest wrote about the Watchers, a group of fallen angels who, according to the biblical account, descended to Earth at Mount Hermon, very near the site of Baalbek. Agrest suggested that the Watchers were, in fact, visitors from another planet who built the megalithic platform at Baalbek as a launch pad. He thought it was a giant stone platform 
that spaceships could land on and take off from. And this makes a lot of sense because it's so incredibly solid with these huge stone blocks in it that even huge vehicles, such as rockets, could land and take off from this huge platform. Two decades after the publication of Agrest's controversial article, author and researcher Zechariah Sitchin came to the same conclusion about Baalbek based on a 5,000-year-old Sumerian text. The Epic of Gilgamesh tells of a hero of superhuman strength who embarks on an impossible quest. In the course of his journeys, Gilgamesh arrives at a site where he encounters otherworldly gods, a site that sounds suspiciously like Baalbek. In the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the great and important legends um, of human history, we have the hero arriving in a place known as the landing place. The space which allows the ascent and the descent of beings from the heavens to the earth. Zechariah Sitchin in the 1970s proposed, based on his reading of the Epic of Gilgamesh, that Gilgamesh himself had seen some sort of a spacecraft take off from a landing site and pinpointed that site as Baalbek. Deeper in the Susa Valley of northern Italy, Noma Orzo takes William Henry to a Roman archaeological site called Il Maumato. But what he wants to show him is something hidden in the woods nearby that predates even the earliest identified Roman ruins. Wow, Nomo. Look at this. Look at this incredible, incredible platform. Yeah, huge wheels uh, surrounded by a lot of very ancient walls. You know, I've seen something like this before in Egypt, at Abu Ghraib. Wheels just like this on this massive platform, quartz crystal embedded. It's like a landing platform. Yeah. Approximately 10 miles south of Cairo, the ancient site of Abu Ghraib contains massive circular alabaster platforms. Local tradition holds that this site is one of the oldest ceremonial centers on the planet and that the alabaster platforms created a harmonic resonance through sound vibrations to open the senses to communicate with divine energies. When I came upon this platform in the middle of this forest, it took me back to Egypt, where you see massive stone altars like this, for example, at Abu Ghraib, that have exactly the same stone wheels in the center. And I'm thinking, this proves the Egyptian connection, too. This is a, a common symbolic element that almost always connects with extraterrestrials. For William Henry, the wheels also present another intriguing possibility. He believes that they may have been made to commemorate the foundational story of the city of Turin, in which it is said that an otherworldly being called Phaeton descended from the sky in a fiery chariot. In the story, the craft in which he descends to Earth is described as having wheels. But it is also said that he brought with him so-called wheels of knowledge. The myth tells us that there was some kind of a craft that came into this area, and they describe wheels that Phaeton left. Wheels of knowledge? Is that what we have here? Wheels that match what we saw with the spirals on the rock of this extraordinary knowledge encoding the secrets of light itself. It's an incredible mystery. It's an incredible it's mystery. Right away, I think of the golden wheels of the, the solar disks in the Aztec and Inca cultures. We know that they were great circles and that on them would be engraved all sorts of knowledge, all sorts of information, astronomy and, and other mythology would be encoded into the surface of the disk. Now, could it be that at Musine we have exactly the same thing happening, that we have this great golden wheel upon which is all of this information? Might the ancient wheels carved into the rock at Il Maumeto be just the tip of an historical iceberg, a sign of the lost ancient city buried beneath the ground? We enter into this valley where, what do we find? These ancient myths 
of a civilization that might have had some extraordinary knowledge that they're trying to protect. And we come into here and look at these walls, more ancient than ancient Rome. Yeah, something that is clear only for people that they can really understand that very ancient story and really cold, yeah. We've seen Valcamonica with these incredible depictions of spacemen on the rocks, thousands of years old, absolutely amazing. Then we come through the gates of Musenay where Constantine saw this flash of light, the heavens open. And across the valley, we have Sacra San Michele where the monk saw the light as well. An extraordinary complex there. It's telling us that there was contact in the ancient world at this place. For some reason, people have been coming into this valley. They're attracted by something here for a very long time and talking about these amazing mysteries and knowledge. Yeah, like, you know, maybe the synchronic lines that they send and receive energy from all over the planet and the universe, here they're very tangible, and that's amazing.